but um, I'm not going to necessarily try to get through it all. But we've been talking about the Old Testament, the seven main Old Testament feasts. And um, I've been using the, the main scripture here, Leviticus 23. If you want to turn there, you can. But I, I've rehashed about every time and and so we don't need to go through it all, but there I wrote down just for reference once again the seven main feasts and the, uh, their celebration is what God intended these feasts to do. He established uh, festivals, times in which they were to remember holidays for them really is what they would, what they would to remember these days and these days had implications behind them that God brought them out. God brought them out of, of slavery. God brought them out of Egypt, delivered them. There wasn't anything they could do, but God brought them out by his hand, by his grace and his mercy, because he has a plan, had a plan, still has a plan for his people. Folks, God has a plan for us, amen? God's brought us out of sin. If you've been saved and you claim to be a Christian, God has delivered you. You out. There was nothing that we could do about it. We was trapped in sin, slaves to sin. But God came down and pulled us up and delivered us from, from darkness to light, from death to life. Praise the Lord for that. And God established these feasts so they would remember him, bring them into a place. And, and so, <coughs> excuse me, to remind them that God, that he was sovereign. Paul says that these feasts were a, a, a representation or a shadow of things to come that would be ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're looking at during these studies is, is how what the, what the feasts were, what their implication was in the Old Testament, but then how they are fulfilled, were fulfilled, and some are to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the work that God has done through Jesus. And so tonight we're going to look here at the, the, the Feast of Pentecost. And back in, uh, I believe, May it was, I actually preached about this, preached on, the, on Pentecost. Um, it was actually on Pentecost Sunday, what it would have been. Um, and it, it, it's... It, neat how that works out, and, and um, Pentecost simply means 50th, it means 50. Um, there I listed several scriptures for reference, if you wanted to look at those for reference, we're not going to read all that, but um, there is a lot of scripture here that I have written down, but it was a one day celebration at the end of the barley harvest season, and the 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 month of Sivan, which would be our May or June on a Sunday, just depending on which day it followed then, it would be in May or June for us. And it was interesting how, remember, May, our Pentecost Sunday fell in May, didn't it? And that works out with our calendar. And they still celebrate Pentecost. <coughs> now they celebrate it a different way than what we celebrate it. But it still correlates and it still uh, works together. And it's, it's really amazing. Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks is also known as in different parts in the scripture as the Feast of Harvest, the Harvest Feast. Um, it, it culminated the Feast of Weeks. Uh, Exodus 34, 22 through 23 says, And thou shalt observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And the feast of gathering at the year's end, thrice in the year, shall all your men appear before the Lord, the God of Israel. So what it's talking about three times a year, that although we're seven feasts, they, they could be umbrellaed in really three feast periods, right? And, and that's in here in a little bit, but, but the Feast of Pentecost was a period all on its own. It was the, so that was one of the three times of year. They'd appear before the Lord. Deuteronomy 16, <laughs> 9 through 12 says, Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee, begin to, the number, begin to the number seven weeks, from such 
time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute, a very free will offering. Now listen, that's important. A free will offering. So the Pentecost, it wasn't, there was a mandatory offerings. There was one's sacrifices that they made, but there was also a free will offering that they could make. Uh, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according to the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Has God blessed you? God has certainly blessed you, amen. And we should be given free will offerings to God, amen. I mean, out of our free will, we want to worship God. He doesn't make us. He doesn't make us give to him. I'm not talking about giving money or whatnot. I'm just talking about giving everything we are to God, who we are. Give him our best, everything we are. Give to God. And um, thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy maidservant or in thy, in thy manservant and the Levite that is within thy gate and the stranger and the fatherless, fatherless and the widow uh, that are among you in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen <coughs> to place his name. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in, aid, in Egypt. Okay? That was the idea. They would remember that they were a slave in Egypt. Don't forget that you were a slave in Egypt. And thou shalt observe and do these statutes. Remember that the first sheaf we looked at last week from the barley harvest was presented to God at Passover, right? But at Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, the first fruits of the wheat harvest were presented to God, ending the barley harvest season. And there's a few things in here. I, I, I won't read all of that, but verse 16 um, talks about, and he shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Go down to verse 17, something very, very important and different about this feast compared to other feasts. Verse 17 talks about the, the flour, the, the, what you're baking, shall be baked with leaven. Now remember that before the unleavened bread, the importance of uh, if leaven was even found in the house, they were kicked out of the community. That's pretty extreme, isn't it? God is serious about sin, but now they were to cook something with leaven. It's a pretty interesting thing to remember to point out. Uh, verse 18, it talks about they shall be a burnt offering unto the Lord. Um, skip, skip ahead, an offering made by fire. For the Lord. In verse 20, and the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruit of a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs, and they shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. Therefore, Pentecost is also called the day of first fruits, not confused with the feast of first fruits. Remember, we talk about the feast of first fruits, but it sometimes it's called the day of first fruits. Number tw Numbers 28 26 says, also in the day of the first fruits, when you bring a new meat offering, remember, a new meat offering unto the Lord, after your weeks be out, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work. And as I said, the Jews still celebrate today, they call it Shavat. The Feast of Shavat is what they call this. Um, Shavat uh, means weeks. This is the Jewish Pentecost, and it's celebrated at the same time, seven weeks uh, from Passover, from Passover, the, the, and the Feast of Weeks, uh, and, 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 and they're celebrating it. This is amazing, recalling, that the, recalling the giving of the law, or the Ten Commandments, right? Remember when Moses gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, um, 50 days after crossing the Red Sea, and so that is the celebration. But God gave these commandments as, a, as the law. In other words, you could almost look at this as, as even though the church is a New Testament thing, right? We know the church is the called out ones. Ecclesia, the called out ones, we are called out. But there was also a type of Old Testament church in which God called his people, 
uh, brought them out and, and gathered them together and to, with a purpose. And really, the law of Moses really instituted what we'd call the Old Testament church. So think about that. It's, it's pretty amazing. There's a lot of stuff, and, um, and, and it goes together. It's pretty amazing. The birth of the Old Testament church. Well, if we look at New Testament Pentecost, and we, 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 we are familiar with the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and, and we've read this, and um, many times this scripture is taken out of context, but it's not really looked upon with the Old Testament Pentecost in mind. But if you look in Acts 2, the first four verses says this, and we'll read this again. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. So think about that, what that means. The Jews were celebrating Pentecost as they regularly would. 50 days after the Passover, right? They were celebrating. So this was a normal thing. The day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all, um, who is they? The disciples, right? They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, here's where the change happens. Here's where the New Testament, the, the, the act, the fulfillment through Christ comes in. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise the Lord. Something that have never happened before in this manner. I'll, I'll finish it. And begin to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. But they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And that is the, the, the focus. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. This is a new thing that God had brought through Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, God would fill certain people at certain times in the Old Testament with the Holy Spirit to accomplish certain things. But folks, now we how, whew, as Christians, we all have access to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing. That's good news. Because I could not make it without the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's good news. There's the New Testament Pentecost. Well, how did these correlate together? So this feast is a little easier to place and figure out the correlation because it tells us right there it was the day of Pentecost, and this is what happened. It tells us, right? We don't have to do math to figure it out. We don't have to date it and look at the, all this. It tells us it was the day of Pentecost. It was fully come. Uh, but what exactly happened on the New Testament day of Pentecost in Acts 2, and how does it correlate to the Old Testament? Well, we know that Jesus was killed during the Passover celebration, right? We talked about Jesus was the perfect Passover lamb that was sacrificed on Passover, on Passover. Raises from the dead three day, on the third day, and then stays in Jerusalem for 40 days before ascending into heaven. The Bible tells us that, doesn't it? That's not me making speculation. The Bible tells us that. And the Bible also tells us that before he ascended at the end of Luke and, and right at the beginning of Acts, we can see this. Jesus told the disciples something very specific to do. He told them to wait. Wait in, in Jerusalem for what? For power from the Holy Spirit. In other words, this power would come through a filling of the Holy Spirit. So wait, don't try to do anything until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Because this church that I have established, Jesus says, this, this new and, and glorious church that I have established, you cannot accomplish anything unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You can try your hardest, you can have good intentions, but you will not accomplish what I have for you unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So he says to wait. 
And he told them about this right before he died back in John 14 when Jesus tells them that there's going to be a comforter that's going to come. Amen? Jesus tells them about this right before, right before he, he, he goes to, to die. What were they waiting on? Well, they were waiting on the Holy Spirit. They were waiting on the fulfillment of Pentecost. The Pentecost, the, the Jewish feast of Pentecost that they were celebrating just as Jesus fulfilled each of the other three feasts, Jesus was going to be fulfilled. Something was going to be fulfilled in Jesus on this day of Pentecost. And it was the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But think about it. We look back at this and we look in hindsight, right? We, we look and we read and it makes sense to us. But I think about the disciples. Jesus told them to wait. But do you... Wait on a comforter? What, 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 do you, what does that mean? I, I, I have to wonder if they knew what they were waiting on. Because remember how wishy-washy the disciples were. Remember, I mean, Thomas doubted all the time. His brothers didn't even believe him. You know, Peter was, was uh, manipulated by a child uh, and... and Talking down Jesus, and I don't know him. I don't, you know, and, I mean, goodness, poor Judas ends his life, sells out Jesus. I mean, my goodness, these disciples needed something, as did all of the Old Testament believers. They needed something. They needed a power, an indwelling power, not just outward laws, not just uh, rules to obey, but they needed the rules written and engraved in their hearts. And that's what Hebrews tells us that I will write, and he goes back and quotes the Old Testament, I will write the laws on their heart. <coughs> but they didn't realize this fulfillment was about to take place. I could, I could, I'd have to assume that, that they didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I mean, they didn't even believe Jesus. No, you'll never leave us. Jesus predicts his death. And the disciples, no, that's not going to happen. No, actually, this is me paraphrasing. Jesus says, actually, yes, it is. That's why I came. I came for this to happen. The disciples are in denial. Do you think it had been any different? But get too ahead of myself here. Let me go ahead and say, but you see the difference when they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? What a difference you see. Peter goes from being this um, quick-tempered, quick to act, act before you think. Anybody ever act before they think? You got to go back and say sorry later. Amen. Been there. That's, that's Peter on steroids. Peter is, is a quick to act before he thinks. But man, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit when it gets a hold of him, he is, he is just a new and, and fulfilled Christian. And you see the, the, the difference it makes. Well, they had done as Jesus had said, apparently. They, were, they waited in Jerusalem. They were there still in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. It was about a week or so after Jesus ascended. They were waiting around for about a week or so. Maybe in a few more days. But they were waiting, and on the day of Pentecost, there they were, celebrating it together. They didn't know probably how long they'd be waiting. Jesus said, wait. He didn't say, wait a week. He didn't say, wait till Pentecost, did he? Jesus didn't tell them, on Pentecost, this will happen. Jesus said, just wait. Wait on the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't realize that they probably didn't realize that something special was going to happen. But as they were celebrating the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes in fullness 50 days after Passover. That tells us right in there the importance of always being ready and prepared. Amen? Being ready and prepared. Being ready to, to, to go where God would call us. Being prepared by 
waiting on God, not overstepping God, not making decisions without God, not letting the decisions that we make be, be God's decisions for us, if that makes sense. I'm, so in other words, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make this decision. I'm just going to pray God blesses it. That's not, that's not God's decision, is it? But, but many times God gives us the answers and, and God gives us direction. So being prepared and, and waiting and, and ready, it's so important. The Feast of Pentecost and is fulfilled with its New Testament correlation on that day. Let me cover, I covered this before. Let's see what I got left. Let me, let me get, let me cover a couple more things and then we will, I'll wrap it up here. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, going back to this Pentecost, it says they were in the house on the day of Pentecost. I did talk about this before, but to, to go over this again, um, I forgot how to pronounce the word. I put it down there and I forgot how to pronounce it. I think it's O O. O-I-K-O-S is the, the Greek word, and I forgot how to pronounce it. Oikos, or o, I think it's, is it oikos or oikos? Oikos? Okay, okay, there you go. That's the, meaning house, material building, or, or a dwelling. Now, the interesting thing about this word is it's used for, it's used in a number of different ways. It is used for a house, a dwelling, but it's also used in Matthew 12, 4, for the house of the Lord. It's the same word, the house of the Lord. Um, and this story is in all three Gospels. Or the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's used in, in the Gospels as the house of God. Um, in 1 Timothy 3.15, the house of God is referred to as the church. 1 Peter 2.5, a, a spiritual house. Same word, house. Matthew 21, and, and in all four Gospels, when Jesus cleanses the temple, remember when he cleanses the temple, he says you've turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves. A house of prayer. In other words, this word house, same, same word. The temple is called a house. In all four Gospels, the same, same word. In Luke 1.33, talks about the house of Jacob or Israel. So refer, many times it's the, it's the church is referred to or the church or in, in the, um, the, the, the epistles, the church in your house. Many times that they refer to the church in your house. So we talk about, when we think about, basically we think about the upper room. Many times we think about it was the upper room of someone's personal house, but it very well could have and really would have made a lot of sense on the day of Pentecost if they were in a house of the Lord or, or in a meeting place or, or in a temple. It could have made sense. It could have been very true. They could have been there. And, and, and then is isn't amazing to think about, though, the house of the Lord, the Holy Spirit shows up. Amen? Amen. And as we are his temple in the New Testament, that God doesn't reside in a building, does he? As he was, as he was presented to in the Old Testament, that he resided in the Holy of Holies. But, but God resides in us, his temple, as Christians. And why it's so important here to be filled with the Holy Spirit or are baptized in the Spirit. So we look at what are the correlations and what do they mean. Just as the first feast of harvest, Exodus 23, gave birth to the Old Testament, 50 days after the first Passover, the church and the fulfillment of the Pentecost in Acts 2 gave birth to the New Testament church 50 days after the perfect sacrifice was given on Passover celebration when Jesus died in our place. Amen? We talked about the substitutionary 
aspect of the atonement or the substitutionary aspect of the work of Christ in which he took our place. He substituted. Uh, it's the, I could call that the great exchange. I think in theology I've heard that before. The great exchange, the best deal you could ever make. We make a lot of deals. Make a lot of financial deals. I know people that like to use the stock market and, and make good deals. And, and we make good deals on houses, cars. Well, we usually don't get the good deal. The dealership usually gets the good deal or the realtor gets the good deal. But we make deals. But I'm telling you, the deal, the best deal you could ever make is we give our sin to Christ and he imputes in us righteousness. That's the greatest deal that can ever be made. And that's the doctrine of substitution uh, that Jesus uh, died in our place. Jesus came to be our sacrifice. And here's, I will, I'll just end on this. It's 10 after. I'm going to end on this and we can pick up. Jesus came to be our sacrifice. Amen. Came to be our sacrifice. He came to save us. To deliver us out of sin. And, and he, he, he died in our place that we would not have to die. Amen. And he was buried. And when he was buried, it shows us that our sins are buried with him and are to never be brought up again. They're buried for good. And they're cast away into the God's sea of forgetfulness. As God says that he doesn't hold our sins against us. That they're as far as the east is from the west. They're buried with Christ. And when Jesus rose again, that sacrifice was waived as acceptable before God. G God came, or Jesus, through salvation, saved us, but, but the full plan, Jesus came to be our sacrifice, not only to save us, but also to fill us with His Spirit. The full, compl the full complete plan of salvation is not just to be delivered from sin, but to be made holy. And it's so important. We, we, we preach, we believe in holiness. And, and I, uh, people say, well, you're one of them. Uh, uh, you know, you're, oh, you're, one, you're one of them holiness churches. You're one of them holiness people. So, well, I hope you are too. Because we're called to be holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. That's not a suggestion. Be holy as I am holy. Does he say don't have any flaws? No. I'm thankful for that. The bar is set. The bar is not set um, that we cannot achieve it, but we achieve wholeness by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that is the beautiful thing about the fulfillment of Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit came down, did something new. Remember, it was a new thing. And 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 remember how they used leaven. They used sin. I, I'll probably. Re recap that again, but, but sin was destroyed by the fire. Meaning that God wants to destroy the sin in us. He doesn't only want to forgive us of our sin. Yes, we're saved, but he wants to destroy the, 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 the sin problem in us. He wants to destroy that. And that was, that was something new and different of any feast that they were going to bake with. Remember leaven. Remember in the Bible, leaven represented sin. Remember? And as they were cooked with the sin, they would bake with the sin. The sin then was destroyed on the molecular level and purged. And God wants to purge sin. That's his plan. It's not for his plan after we die. It's not just for them. But his, I believe his plan right now is, is to, he wants to rid that. And make us holy. Amen? Praise Lord. And I believe it is, a, it, is, it is accomplishable, if that's a word. It's doable. It's doable. By His grace and mercy. Amen? Amen. Only by His... It, it's not me. It's not us individuals. It's not how we're good enough that we can be holy. It's not an outward holiness. It's not an appearance. It's not, it's not all these things outward. But it's an inward holiness. The yielding of our will... That God's will being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, For God's will, this is a, a different version here, but for God's will was for us to be made holy 
by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. God's will was for us to be made holy. King James says, by the which we uh, will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Remember, sanctified has two meanings, to be set apart and to be made holy. It's God's will for us to be sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's God's will. Entire sanctification is God's will in the life of a believer. I believe that. It says it right there. Be made holy. Holiness is God's will. But it's through Jesus Christ. Amen. Through him alone. Not through our attempts. But through him alone. Amen. That's the beautiful thing. Well, I'll pick up and try to finish the rest of this in, in a couple weeks. Lord willing. I won't be with you next Wednesday. John's going to lead the Bible study next Wednesday. So that'll be a treat. And I wish I could be here for it. But. Maybe uh, someone can figure out how to set it up back here. Maybe I can still watch it. <laughs> but uh, praise the Lord. When the bells have anything tonight, aren't you glad that, that God just gives us the strength and power to overcome sin? Nothing we can do ourselves, but only through him, only through the power of the Holy Spirit can we, can we have that. Aren't you